Well, it's a great pleasure to be here at the uh, Kansas City Public Library. I, I see the uh, library seems to have fallen off on the screen, but uh, uh, <laughs> I think you know where you are. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I want to thank uh, the Oxford University Press for helping to organize this event, and I want to thank all of you uh, for coming today in this, in this beautiful day, uh, especially. I want to talk today about several aspects about the, uh, of the 1930s, most of all uh, Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal. Roosevelt's New Deal was controversial in its time, and it remains controversial in the United States again. The New Deal is credited by liberals with creating an effective and compassionate modern government. It is condemned by conservatives uh, for creating a corrupting welfare state, an intrusive regulatory system, and an erosion of the autonomy of, of individuals and the free market. It is considered by liberals to be a living, evolving force in American politics, and it is uh, considered by others to be an obsolete, obsolete relic of a repudiated past. I'm not going to talk today about where the New Deal came from or what it failed to achieve in the 1930s. I want, rather, to speak about its legacies about how the New Deal continues to shape American life still today. The New Deal was a remarkably diverse set of efforts reflecting the unusually eclectic ideologies of the people who worked in Roosevelt's government and Roosevelt's own willingness to tolerate a broad range of ideas. There were New Deal programs of great daring and originality and New Deal programs of surprising clumsiness and lack of imagination. New Deal programs that were strikingly, strikingly liberal, even radical, and New Deal programs that were highly conservative. New Deal programs that worked, and New Deal programs that failed. New Deal goals that were achieved, and New Deal goals that were never met including the single most important such goal, which was ending the Great Depression, which Roosevelt could never do until World War II did it for him. But my purpose here today is not to describe those aspects of the New Deal that shone brightly for a time and then disappeared without a trace, among them uh, the National Recovery Administration, uh, the CCC, the WPA, and other uh, organizations that were popular and successful in their time but have largely disappeared. But instead, I want to talk about the elements of the New Deal that have left an enduring legacy in American life. And there are several areas in which I believe the legacy of the New Deal remains visible today. And that's what I want to talk about uh, this afternoon. But let me begin with Franklin Roosevelt uh, himself. Uh, no evaluation of the legacy of the New Deal would be complete without attention to the legacy of Franklin Roosevelt himself and to the impact of his le leadership on his successors and on other leaders from all around the world. There is some irony in this, for Roosevelt himself was not always the powerful, committed figure that he appeared to be. He was, unbeknownst to the vast majority of Americans at the time, he was completely paralyzed from the waist down by polio and entirely unable to walk without the assistance of an elaborate system of braces, crutches, and canes. He was mostly confined to wheelchairs. And this, by the way, is the only known photograph of Franklin Roosevelt in a wheelchair uh, and was never supposed to be uh, left out into the uh, public. And during the last years of his life and his presidency, uh, Roosevelt was dis desperately ill. His condition concealed from all but a few of those who depended on him. Roosevelt was also a leader without strong convictions or principles, and he was often criticized, both at the time and since, for his apparent absence of conviction. 
He was, according to the historian Richard Hofstadter, he was content in large measure to follow public opinion and thus charted no clear path. He allowed the existing political landscape to dictate his course. The historian James McGregor Burns lamented, uh, instead of reshaping the Democratic Party to serve his own purposes. Such complaints were common among Roosevelt's contemporaries as well, most of all among those who had invested the greatest hopes in him. There seemed to be something almost slippery about the man with his eagerness to please everyone with whom he talked, with uh, his ability to persuade people expressing two opposing views and saying that he agreed with them both, with his tendency to allow seemingly contradictory initiatives to proceed simultaneously. Senator Huey Long of Louisiana once complained of Roosevelt. When I talk to him, he says, fine, fine, fine. But Joe Robinson, who was the Senate Majority Leader and one of Long's ideological nemeses, Joe, Joe Robinson goes to see him the next day, and again he says, fine, fine, fine. Maybe he says fine to everybody. Henry Stimson, Roosevelt's Secretary of War from 1944 until the end of the war, uh, was const constantly frustrated by this enigmatic man, so much so that not long after Roosevelt died, Stimson privately expressed relief that in Harry Truman, the new president, he finally had someone willing to make a clear-cut and unequivocal decision. Roosevelt's fundamentally political nature, his rejection of all but a few fixed principles and his inclination to measure each decision against its likely popular reaction, that may have been a significant weakness, as some of his critics have claimed, or, as others would uh, say, his greatest strength, as others insist, insisted, but it was the essence of the man. And Roosevelt's ideological flexibility, frustrating as it may have been to those around him, was, in fact, one of his greatest strengths as a leader for it was responsible for one of the New Deal's most conspicuous and, in my opinion, most valuable features, its commitment to pragmatic experimentation. Roosevelt inherited a political world constricted in countless ways by fervently held principles on both the left and the right. Conservatives hewed on principle to the gold standard, to a balanced budget, to the sanctity of private contracts, to the obligation to protect capital, whatever the cost, and above all, to the belief that the invisible hand of the market must be permitted to govern the affairs of society without any interference from the visible hand of the state. Some on the left embraced a hostility to capitalism itself and in, in insistence on punishing the wealthy. Into that ideologically constricted world, Roosevelt introduced a willingness to consider striking innovations, to cast aside deeply held inhibitions, to treat beliefs not as fixed and inviolable principles, but as things to be tested and, if necessary, revised or even repudiated. There were, of course, many things he could not do, some principles he would not abandon, some important new ideas he was slow to embrace or to which he was always resistant. But much of what was important about the New Deal was a result of the degree to which Franklin Roosevelt was open to what he liked to call the spirit of persistent experimentation. Critics and admirers alike have argued that the New Deal reflected nothing but pragmatic responses to immediate problems, that it was, as Hofstadter again uh, described, little more than a chaos of experimentation. One of Roosevelt's erstwhile advisors, Raymond Moley, wrote in a sour memory, memoir published after his falling out with the president, and he wrote in his book about Roosevelt, to look upon these programs, meaning the New Deal programs, 
to, to look upon these programs as the result of a unified plan was to believe that the accumulation of stuffed snakes, baseball pictures, school flags, old tennis shoes, carpenter's tools, geometry books, and chemistry sets in a boy's bedroom could have been put there by an interior decorator. <laughs> but this also reflected Roosevelt's instinct for action, his belief in, if nothing else, the obligation of the leaders of government to work aggressively and affirmatively to deal with the nation's problems. Take a method and try it, Roosevelt liked to say. If it fails, admit it frankly and try another. But above all, try something. In a rapidly changing world of increasing uncertainty and complexity, there is, I believe, much to be said for the legacy of ideological flexibility and spirited experimentation that the New Deal bequeathed to American public life. Roosevelt believed in capitalism, as all but a few Americans did. He also believed that government had a positive obligation to save it from its difficulties, and that among the things necessary to save it was assistance to the victims of its collapse. But he had few deep commitments beyond that and was instead, to the frequent frustration of more principled people around him, he was instead endlessly flexible, always compromising, frequently dissembling, never fully trustworthy or loyal to those with whom he worked. But Roosevelt was a great leader despite and perhaps because of what these seem to be weaknesses. His paralysis from polio, which was surely one of the most important aspects of his life from the early 20s until his death, gave him much of the stealing determination that allowed him to pretend to walk and that made him president and that allowed him to survive through four national campaigns. It also gave him much of the public demeanor of sunny, garrulous optimism. Because Roosevelt, like many disabled people, went to great lengths to distract people from his disability by being conspicuously cheerful and self-confident, an image he skillfully conveyed not just to those around him, but also to the entire nation and even the world. Whatever the reasons, Roosevelt presented himself to the world as a beacon of confidence and optimism, and in the panicked environment in which he entered office, that alone was a significant achievement. Not able to travel, Roosevelt used the radio. Uh, and there he is sitting uh, in the Oval Office uh, giving his weekly radio speech. The firm, confident voice, the smiling optimism, the cock of the head, the up-tilted cigarette holder, the beaming smile, all of this meant Franklin Roosevelt. And all of this helped many desperate people to believe that there was hope in their leadership, that the leader of their nation was not just a bureaucrat, but a symbol of their highest aspirations. And that image has survived for almost 80 years as a potent model of presidential leadership that have shaped the view of many presidents since him. One of Roosevelt's important legacies is a political one the formation of a new and powerful national coalition of voters that made the Democratic Party, a weak minority party for nearly 40 years before Roosevelt's election, into the dominant party in the United States for several decades to come. The New Deal coalition, as it is known, no longer survives in anything like the form it assumed in the 1930s. And the Democratic Party no longer has the extraordinary dominance it had from the 1930s 
through the 1960s. But significant elements of that coalition remain important uh, to American political life still. Uh, and this is, at Rose, uh, this is Roosevelt uh, standing at the uh, Democratic Convention in 1932. The New Deal made the Democratic Party the preferred party for people of liberal or progressive or leftist inclinations in the United States, many of whom had previously considered the Republican Party the party of Theodore Roosevelt and many other reformers who were more reliably progressive. But Franklin Roosevelt, uh, Theodore Roosevelt's distant cousin, drew away many of the Republican progressives. And in doing so, he helped create a broad coalition of progressives who created a core constituency of the Democratic Party almost ever since. The New Deal also helped create a strong and enduring alliance between the Democratic Party and organized labor, labor, which owed much of its economic strength to Roosevelt's New Deal labor legislation. Both the power of unions and their ability to shape their members' political views has declined significantly since then, but the alliance with labor organizations still survives as a distinctive and important part of the Democratic Party still. And the New Deal made the Democratic Party the party of African Americans and most other minorities. Black Americans were mostly Republican in the 70 years after the Civil War, a tribute to Lincoln and his party's connection with the abolition of, of slavery. But Roosevelt made African Americans into Democrats. That was not because the New Deal committed itself to the struggle among African Americans for civil rights in the 1930s. On the contrary, the Roosevelt administration was noble, notably timid about civil rights issues. But the New Deal did provide African Americans with desperately needed social services, and at times, at least, suggested a greater sympathy for their larger aspirations for equality than had most previous presidents. By 1936, over 90% of African Americans were voting for Roosevelt and the Democrats, and that hasn't changed very much since. But it wasn't simply Franklin Roosevelt's pragmatic effort to bring African Americans into the party. It was also Eleanor Roosevelt's commitment to helping African Americans to work for equality and justice. And this is a picture of uh, Eleanor Roosevelt uh, with Mary McLeod Methuen, who was one of the first uh, people to work within the White House as an African American. Together, these changes in the Democratic Party's constituency, along with its subsequent loss of some of its more conservative groups, most notably the withdrawal of white Southerners from the party beginning in the 1960s, the Democratic Party's constituency has com contributed to making the Democratic Party consistently the more progressive of the two parties. And that remains true today, despite the continuing and successful efforts of many Democrats to move more to the center. Now, another way in which Roosevelt's New Deal has left an enduring legacy on modern America is in transforming the nation's physical landscape. Because the New Deal was among the most expansive and ambitious episodes in the construction of public works of any period in American history. The 1930s was, in fact, a period of great public works building in much of the industrial world, and particularly in, na in nations where there were strong governments attempting both to progress to make progress against the depression and create a physical image of and monument to themselves. And in that respect, the New Deal had something in common with Germany, Italy, and the Soviet Union in the 1930s, all of which were building uh, remarkably uh, important uh, <clears throat> buildings and uh, infrastructure. Uh, this is the Fort Peck uh, Dam. 
uh, one of the uh, one of the biggest dam uh, ever made. Uh, this is a famous picture uh, by Margaret Burke White. Uh, this picture was on the first cover of Life magazine. The physical legacy of the New Deal is visible in almost every community in the United States, in schools and post offices and government office buildings built by the WPA, and in the striking murals with which the Treasury and the WPA arts projects adorned many of them, many of these buildings, uh, and this is one of them. It is visible in the first major public housing projects in American history. Uh, it created bridges, highways, harbors, dams, and other hydroelectric projects, bridges, highways, which helped, helped uh, transform the economic future of previously backward areas of the South and West and prepared them for the great post-war development that changed these regions into the prosperous developed region that is now known as the Sun Belt, the fastest growing area of the United States. And the New Deal's legacy is visible in the connection of countless once isolated rural people to the modern world through electrification projects, especially uh, the REA that made it possible for them to begin living as most other 20th century Americans lived. And there is the one of the uh, famous posters of the Rural Electrification Administration. Some historians have argued that the public investment or state capitalism of the New Deal was the principal goal of some of the most important New Dealers, and it was the source of Roosevelt's single most important legacy, although I'm not sure that I agree with that. Almost certainly, the most conspicuous and controversial legacy of the New Deal is its contribution to the creation of the modern welfare state. And those contributions took several forms. In the 1930s, the New Deal was perhaps best known to unemployed Americans for its vast work relief programs through which the government created paying jobs, many of them on the public works programs that I've just described, to get men and some women back to work and to help families survive the crisis. Work relief was an, appearing, uh, an appealing temporary solution to the problem of unemployment because it addressed a clear and compelling need. And he did so in a way that seemed to preserve the principle that relief should be earned and that no one should receive something for nothing. But virtually none of the New Deal's relief programs survived World War II, largely because the war produced so much demand for labor that it was hardly necessary any longer for the government to create jobs. But the experience of work relief did, however, one important lasting impact. It created a precedent for the still powerful assumption among most Americans that the government should assist them when they are in trouble. And while the government has not always responded effectively to those expectations, that expectation survives. The more enduring institutional contributions of the New Deal to the creation of the modern welfare state fall into two categories. One was the wide range of new programs and protections that have helped mostly middle class people. Mortgage protection for homes and small farms, insurance of personal bank deposits, income tax deductions for interest on home mortgages, and many other economic benefits and protections that have provided increased security and opportunity for middle class Americans. The other is the equally wide range of programs that have established the basic structure of the formal welfare state of the remainder of the 20th century and into the 21st. Unemployment insurance, pensions for the elderly, aid to the disabled, and perhaps most controversial, assistance to single mothers with children, all of them products of the Social Security Act of 1935, 
the single uh, most important piece of social welfare legislative, uh, legislation in American history. Uh, and this is a uh, poster uh, that came out in 1935, the year that uh, the uh, Social Security uh, uh, legislation uh, began, uh, and this is the, uh, one of the very first posters trying to tell people about Social Security. The, no deal, the New Deal welfare state created much of what social protection Americans uh, principally, presently uh, receive. Uh, this is a uh, early uh, poster uh, of unemployment compensation trying to explain it uh, to the unemployed. So the New Deal welfare state, as I said, created much of what social production, uh, protection Americans pres presently received. And some of those programs have been and have remained very successful. Most notably, unemployment insurance, something that's been particularly important uh, in the last few years, which has removed some of the desperation from the lives of men and women who were temporarily laid off from work. And old age pensions uh, through Social Security, which contributed to lifting millions of elderly Americans out of poverty and making them a group no longer the poorest group of Americans, but among the most affluent. But the New Deal also built into its welfare programs the long-standing distinction between the deserving and the undeserving, the so-called undeserving poor, which led to the provision of relatively generous benefits to those who could be said to have earned them or paid for them, and that includes veterans, workers and old people who have paid uh, for Social Security and who had made contributions to insurance programs and then the much less generous benefits to those who simply needed them, and most notably single women with children whose benefits were never large to were always accompanied by intrusive screening recruitments. Since 1996, of course, the federal welfare program have moved in a very different direction with benefits aimed at people who work more than, who work more than people who do not thus helping to link the welfare system to the New Deal's earlier preoccupation with workfare and also helping to reduce the controversy around welfare. And then in the later years of the New Deal, in the aftermath of a serious recession in 1937 and in response to the obstinacy of a depression that five years of New Deal efforts had failed to end. Franklin Roosevelt began experimenting with other approaches to economic policy uh, when the recession began, most notably with what was coming to be known as Keynesian uh, economics. Uh, and that's uh, John Maynard Keynes on the front page of Time Magazine. An ill-advised effort uh, to, ba oh, and what, what it says on this, uh, you can't, see it up there on the corner, uh, the uh, title of, of this uh, uh, article, The Keynesian Influence on the Expansionist Economy. And again, an ill-advised ill effort to balance the budget by cutting government spending had appeared to precipitate the disastrous 1937-1938 recession. And in response uh, to the beginning of Keynesianism, a vigorous new program of spending and investment launched in early 1938 helped bring the economy back to at least limited life. And out of that partial success emerged the growing belief that government could influence the economy through its monetary and fiscal policies through its control over the money supply and its ability to raise and lower spending and taxation. To many younger New Dealers, the discovery of the power of these fiscal and monetary instruments was a revelation. It was, they now believed, possible to manage capitalism without managing the institutions of capitalism to help the economy revive without engaging in the politically and bureaucratically difficult way of forcing capitalists to change their behavior. 
To the most exuberant Keynesians, this discovery seemed to mean that the greatest dilemma of the modern industrial world had been resolved, that the problem of monopoly, the problem that had preoccupied and frustrated generations, need no longer preoccupy modern society, that it would be possible to lead the way to economic growth, not by focusing on producers, but by helping consumers, by pumping money into the hands of the millions of men and women who created the markets for what capitalists produced. The New Deal never fully embraced the Keynesian Revolution, and indeed, no subsequent American government ever fully embraced it either. But however government, not, <clears throat> but however differently from its intentions, the New Deal did help create the belief that government not only had a responsibility to create or sustain prosperity, but that it could do so without intruding too directly into the affairs of the capitalist world. By the end of the 1930s, many economists were arguing that economic growth, not a redistribution of wealth or power, was the best route to freedom and empowerment. The government did not need to, regulation, to regulate production. It should rather find ways to encourage consumption. The goal should be a rising standard of living for everyone, the lifting of workers and farmers and others on the margins of the modern economy and taking them out of poverty. Government policies would, therefore, not be primarily concerned with changing capitalism. Public policy would, rather, be principally concerned with compensating for capitalism's failures, stimulating the economy, uh, when the economy flagged, redistributing resources through various welfare mechanisms when the private economy failed. And a product of the new liberalism, which places and placed so much emphasis on the satisfaction of private desires and the fulfillment of individual aspirations, that was the growing post-war commitment to civil rights and personal liberties the identification of liberalism with the search for racial justice and the empowerment of women and minorities, even the opening up of American culture to diverse and often divisive voices. But the expansion of rights and liberties, uh, which emerged uh, long after Roosevelt's death, was an indirect result of the New Deal because most New Dealers in the 1930s for most of them, the principal goal of public life was economic, not social or cultural progress. The goals, and to some degree, the result of the New Deal were prosperity, growth, opportunity, and security. Those goals, they believed, not, were not only compatible, but critically interdependent. There has been much criticism of the new form of liberalism from both the left and the right, it is, to, it is, some critics have claimed, a morally barren creed, interested only in the material well-being of citizens and incapable of creating in them the sense of community and civic commitment that many people believe a healthy democracy needs. But it, 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 is, it, but it is, others have argued, a liberalism that has abandoned the quest for a genuinely democratic society and has been content to allow, to allow large corporate organizations to increase their power in exchange for the hollow, hollow uh, compensation of greater material comfort for individuals. So uh, some recent critics would argue that consumption and population growth have created grave dangers to the future of the planet. Still others uh, <clears throat> argue that this liberalism, even in its indirect efforts to spur economic growth, was an interference with the free market. And there may be some justification for all these criticisms. In the aftermath of the New Deal, in other words, uh, ideas uh, of, from the right and from the left began to move in against what the New Deal uh, was doing in the 1930s. But despite our own current economic woes, when one looks at the history of the Western industrial world 
since the end of World War II, it is hard not to be astonished at the remarkable changes that occurred in the lives of ordinary people almost everywhere in post-war America. The striking increases in standards of living throughout the Western world, the dramatic improvements in housing and diet, the great increase in leisure and the rise of new forms of entertainment and comfort, this achievement has not solved all the world woes, to be sure, as the economic crisis of 2008 suggests. But I believe that the lifting of hundreds of millions of people out of poverty into affluence is one of the great, if still incomplete, feats of modern history. It is not, of course, an achievement that can be attributed solely or even largely to the New Deal or to the United States. But it is, in part, a product of the vision that Franklin Roosevelt and his government helped to legitimize uh, and a model of economic growth that is still relevant to our own troubled times. In the midst of the greatest economic crisis in the history of the industrial world, at a time of darkness and fear and growing despair. America and many other nations dared to dream of an economic future fueled by engaged and committed government in which prosperity could be universal, in which unemployment could be eliminated, in which the lives of ordinary people might be elevated and transformed. That not be only or even the greatest aspiration one can imagine for a modern society, but it is an aspiration that helped to create the world we have come to know, a world that is now in jeopardy in many ways, a world that I believe could use something similar to a New Deal and could use someone like Franklin Roosevelt to help us recover from our own current crisis and to move us forward to a new era of progress. Thank you very much. <laughs>